You are listening to the Gateway Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. To learn more, visit us at thegatewaygh.com. This has been the long-awaited Christmas series. We've been working, thinking about this behind the scenes, and I thought we want to kick this series off right and I need your help to do so. And so without further ado, I'm going to lead you in this great Christmas carol. Would you sing this with me? It's the most wonderful time of the year with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling be of good cheer. Come on, give me a little more. It's the most wonderful time of the year. All right, pause for a second. Where is too little, too low? Help me out. Give me the give me the note. Um, no? Help me out, man. <laughs> it's the half happiest seed. That's better. Of, of all. There we go. Now we got it. With those holidays, greetings, and gay happy meet from friends from come to call. It's the half happiest season of all. Hold it out, hold it out. There'll be parties for hosting, mellows for toasting, and caroling out in the snow. There'll be scary both story and tales of the glory of Christmas is long, long ago. Now really belt it out. It's the most wonderful. And that's where we're going to stop it. That's where we're going to stop it. And I understand this may ruin this song for some of you, but it is not the most wonderful time of the year for many people. Because Christmas is a complicated time. How many agree? And the next time you hear that song, I want to bring you back to this moment and say, it is not the most wonderful time. You think about it. There's things that come up, like our faith, and maybe the faith or the tradition of our background, and we start questioning. And there may be some of you that are here and, and that are guests, and you're, you're, you're trying to just understand, you know, do, what do I even believe? And so faith can become something that we have to think about. And then at Christmas, we are all faced with our wonderful families. And yes, we love our families. I love my in-laws deeply, even when I yelled at my mother-in-law that one time. But how many know that there are family dynamics oftentimes that complicate things and and it's tough, and, uh, and so we, we're, we're, you know, it's just, it's one of those things. And then the finances, oh man, the expectations and the, uh, the expenditures, they just pile up. And when you think of Christmas, and you think of faith and family and finance, and you add to it the busyness, the, the craziness of the, seri- of the season, well, several months ago, we were talking about this and saying these are a few of the things that we might want to talk about in our Christmas series. And so we were getting creative and brainstorming and, and we were working and we pulled in a, a few of the staff and a few of the friends and we saw the, the three F's, the, uh, the faith, the family, the finances, and we said, oh, the busyness of the season. And we said, oh, that, that's another, we, another F is the frenzy. And so now we've got the frenzy and now we got four F's and someone said, something I'm not supposed to say this service, um, that you could call the series My Something Christmas and uh, the Fs of Christmas. And, uh, and we didn't do that. We didn't go that way. Instead, we said, let's talk and let's simplify things. And so we settled on simple Christmas. And I know what you're thinking. Simple and Christmas, they don't go together. But let's just think about it for a second simplified, reordered, our expectations examined. And you say, well, why would we do that? Well, I believe that we can experience the best Christmas we've ever had. I want you to dream with me for a second. What if this Christmas could be different? Seriously, where it's not so pressure-filled, it's not so busy, 
There's not maybe as much baking or as so many parties. There's not so much frenzy, so to speak. Instead, what if this Christmas could be simplified? And I, I mean it, really. What if this Christmas could be simplified? And I know you're thinking, that's not possible. Yeah, and I get it. The idea of Christmas, the idea of simple, they don't necessarily uh, mesh naturally. But I believe it's possible. And I know what you're thinking, as, if, especially if you're a mom. You're thinking, Ma, <laughs> I'm a mother, and the workload at Christmas triples. How many of the moms agree that the workload at Christmas seems to triple, right? The baking for neighbors and cookies for a cookie exchange and workplace and the church social. And then not only do you get to bake all of that, then you get to attend all those extra events and parties and with the kids, not to mention the rehearsals, right? And the decorating and the gifts and the shopping and the wrapping and the mailing. And the mom's schedule just goes, whoo, right? And simple and Christmas, they don't always seem to mesh. You say, well, why are you talking about moms? What about dads? Well, I don't know how it is at your house. At my house, I get about one-tenth of the extra busyness compared to my wife. And I don't know why that is, but it just is. And then, do you know what gets me? It's the kids. They jump around, and they're all excited. They're like in this dream-like state of anticipation, right? And they don't get it. They're actually more energized, and they're, they got more excitement, and they got more anticipation and more expectation, right? Oh, to be a kid again, right? But as adults, it's like, oh, the drudge. And think about it. For business owners, does Christmas and simple blend? A business has to decide when they're going to give time off and are they going to give a bonus. And at the year end, a lot of times there's quotas or budgets that are due and reviews. It's not the most wonderful time of year. For doctors and nurses, if you're in that industry, you know that the month of December is the busiest season to go to the doctor, that's because everyone's got their HSA that they've got to get in and get see their doctor before the end of the year, use those funds. And how many teachers do we have here? I know we've got a few teachers. You think of all the crazy kids they got to <laughs> deal with, right? And the homework and the tests to get out of the way, the parties, the plays, the ex the, all the extra stress. And if you're in the retail business, which I know a few of you are, you got long hours and again, just people everywhere. And I know what some of you are thinking, well, you must be exempt from that because you're a pastor, right? And you're so blessed to be a pastor. And at this time of year, you get to share the most wonderful story that ever was, right? And the topic's picked for you, and so you don't even have to think about it, right? It's easy. Well, that's wrong. I've been in full-time ministry for 21 years, and do you know how hard it is to think of the same story and create a new twist every year? I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying, it's complicated. And when it comes to singing and, uh, and the Christmas songs and Christmas carols, sometimes they're short, sometimes they're not worshipful, there's a lot to consider. You tracking with me? It's insanity. Christmas and simple do not seem to naturally mix. But the days leading up to Christmas when they should be having uh, more expectation, it seems like they're less. When you should be looking for a time to rest, there seems to be more exhaustion. And I wonder, with all of our attempts to enjoy Christmas, is it easy to miss out on experiencing Christmas? What really matters? And what seems to get missed many times is experiencing Jesus. And Lord, help us with that. Listen, we end up forgetting Emmanuel. We forget Emmanuel, God with us. And it's true that the days leading up, they should be filled with a sense of awareness, right? The presence, the voice of God, the, the will of God. And there are some traditions that do a better job at that than us. I don't know if you came from a tradition where you celebrate, I think that's how you say it, celebrate Advent, or you um, work through Advent, uh, the anticipation of Christ. That wasn't the way I grew up, and that was a new idea. But the frenzy, no matter what, it often often will overshadow the rest of the season. Am I right? Busyness 
can destroy your ability to enjoy Christmas. Busyness can halt the presence, the voice of God being manifest. And the problem is, is it can and it often does if we're not careful. So I'm convinced, though, that what we need most, more than anything, and this is what I want to talk about this morning, is we need the presence of God and not more presence. Not presence, but presence. Presence, not presence. Say that with me. Presence, not presence. And what I thought is, let's look at the Word of God for a moment and look at areas where we see the greatest gift that was ever given, the presence of God, and how that's highlighted in Scripture. The first place I want to take you is Psalm 16, verse 11. And as you turn there, I love this. It, it's an area that talks about finding the fullness of joy, and jo Christmas should be a, a season full of joy for sure. Look what Psalm 16, verse 11 says. It says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I love that. That there's, when you're in the presence of God, there's naturally a joy that comes with that. And what comes against that joy many times is our self, right? And especially when we are struggling with our sin nature. And uh, you think about it, when we get caught up in our sin, what do we do? We need to get back into the presence of God. And we see in Psalm 51, turn with me there, it's a great story of David, King David. He, he had fallen into adultery and he was exposed by the prophet Nathan. Nathan comes to him and says, you are the man, you're the one that... Uh, that has killed uh, Uriah, I think, is that right? I'm not sure. But anyway, Psalm 51, this is David's confession, and look what he adds into it. He says this, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then look what verse 11 says. He says, I Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. What David knew and what we need to understand is that when we are away from God or we've been distanced by our sin, we need to be back in the presence of God. And that's where we get forgiveness. That's where we get fullness again. Isn't that beautiful? The presence of God makes the difference. When we talk about presence, why don't you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 uh, just actually two chapters before that in Isaiah 7, verse 14, that's where uh, they're announcing the, the sign of Emmanuel, Jesus coming to earth. It says uh, in chapter 7, verse 14, I don't think it's on the screen, but it says the virgin will conceive and give the birth uh, to a son and he will call him Emmanuel. And then if you just go just the next page over, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, Verses 2 and 3, it talks about Jesus says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The great light was Jesus coming. And on those living on the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. Jesus was coming. It says, You have, in, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They're, they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. And in one version, it says this, They will be glad in your presence. They will be glad in your presence. I love that. Finding the presence of God. If you fast forward now to J uh, John chapter 1, in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see a narrative about Jesus coming to earth and uh, the Christmas story. In John chapter 1, the Christmas story is caught up in one verse. It's in verse 14, and it says this, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In other words, the presence of God came to earth through Jesus, his one and only Son. And the bottom line is, if you go back to Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 1, and you look at the Christmas story, Joseph and Mary and Jesus coming in a manger, it says in verse 21, she, that's Mary, will give birth to a son and you will to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22 says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we saw that prophesied in Isaiah 
chapter 7. The greatest gift God ever gave, his presence, God with us. It's the true meaning of Christmas. It's God's greatest gift. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He sent him, and we celebrate it at Christmas. And there's this perfect story in Scripture that really captures this idea, this struggle between being in the presence of God and in the craziness of, uh, of a season, the busyness and then the presence. And the story is marked by two characters in particular. They are sisters. It's Mary and Martha. They're sisters of Lazarus, who was one of Jesus' uh, closest friends. They both loved Jesus. And in John chapter 11, in fact, you can turn there with me, John chapter 11, we see Lazarus die, right? And then Jesus is comforting the sisters. Uh, Jesus weeps over Lazarus, and then he raises Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 12, that's where I want you to, to end up, I guess. John chapter 12, we see that after that Lazarus has been raised from the dead, well, let's look at it. John chapter 12, verse 1. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Let me pause there. We read that, and we just kind of move on, and we think, oh, wow, okay. Someone was dead, and they were raised to life. Can you imagine how that would have changed that community, how that would have changed that body of believers? I mean, it, would have ra- they were st- it was fresh on their mind. And they were, they were uh, excited about that. And so they created a, a dinner to honor Jesus. Look what it says. Here, here a dinner was given to, for in Jesus' honor. And then it says, Martha served. They wrote, say, Martha served. While Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Typical man, right? That's how, it, at least at my house, that's how it works, <laughs> right? It says, then Mary, everyone say Mary, it says, Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So we have two women here with totally different responses. We see Mar- Martha serving, and Mary anoints Jesus with oil and uses her hair to wash his feet I don't understand that. I can't get my mind around that, but that's what happened. So there's a distinction here. Mary and Martha, very different. Now let's look back at uh, Luke chapter 10. Uh, Same two ladies, different time, different story, but the same exact response. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, And Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to the village where a woman named Martha opened her house or opened her home to him nice thing to do right says she had uh she had a sister called mary who sat at the lord's feet listening to what he said but martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made she came to him and asked lord you don't care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself tell her to help me and jesus said martha martha You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. I love that. Mary has chosen what is better, and it is not going to be taken away from her. And so what we see here is Martha first. And when I, when we see that, that name Martha, I want you to think the frenzy, the busyness, the craziness caught up in all the details, caught up in serving, and she actually gets frustrated. Now, let's just take a little survey. Is there any adults here or even students that have ever been frustrated with the busyness, the frenzy of Christmas? Oh, yeah. So you can put yourself in her shoes, right? The frenzy. So Martha, the frenzy. But then on the flip side, we see Mary. In both of these stories, both of these instances, she's listening, she's not distracted, she seemed to know what was most important, she's anointing Jesus, it's like she's worshiping at his feet, and then in Luke chapter 10, uh, she's called out by her sister, and and Jesus says, no, what Mary has chose is better. It's better. 
And church, you've got to know this, that the presence of God in your life is better. It's better than anything. It's better. And at Christmas time, we need to hear just that. More presence, not more presence. You tracking with me? You say, well, what's the solution? Well, if you Google this or start looking and like I did and over the last uh, several uh, weeks and months, uh, there are a lot of thoughts about busyness and Christmas, and, and there's a lot of things that you can kind of wrap your mind around. There's a few that caught my attention. One guy said, uh, you need to accept the reality of the business, uh, busyness. All the extra parties, all the extra events, you need to just kind of own it, and uh, it just is what it is. And there's probably some truth in that. Another person said, you got to watch for signs of busyness. And what are the signs? Are you exhausted? Is there tension in your body? Are you over-emotional? Or are you, do you uh, get prone to sickness a little easier? And if those are the case, you've got you to gotta slow down. You've got to stop the frenzy, right? But I really liked what one person said. You have to learn to say no. <laughs> and that is really hard. If there's a certain party that fills you with dread that you go to every year, don't go, right? Unless it's my party, and then I want to make sure you're there, right? Just kidding, just kidding. But seriously, people might misunderstand you. That's okay. It's okay to say no. Everyone say it with me. No. And I know it's hard to say. Say it one more time. No, right? And there's these ideas, and we've got to learn to say no. But more than saying no, somehow we all have to figure out a way to invite Jesus into the chaos. And for some of us, it's easier than others. For others, it's not even on your mind. One pastor, his name is Tyler Regan, uh, he had a little devotional I ran across where he mentions four themes that have helped him shape his priorities in the holidays, especially in a busy season. And I'd like to share kind of some snippets from that because it really uh, made an impact on me and has really challenged me. The first thing he said is you have to find time to rest. You got to rest. December 25th is the same year or same day every year. Don't let it sneak up on you. It's important to be intentional to slow down. One of the things he said, he said, for my family, he said, this looks like constantly reminding myself of the why behind the what. Why are we traveling? Why are we decorating the house and hosting friends? Why are we shopping for gifts? Questioning the intentions of our activities forces us to slow down, he said, and to rest in the purpose of the season. And then he goes on, he talks about working with his team. And so I thought, man, this is great. Like our, our uh, pastoral team or our staff, he says, for my team, and this is a quote, he says, resting in the holiday season looks like creating time in space for us to participate in life-giving activities together. Whether it's an office gift exchange or potluck lunch or a couple days working from home. He says, I want to creatively make a way for my team to feel as if they can slow down and rest even in their workplace. I thought, man, Lord, help me. And I told the, the guys earlier, Bruce was here and Bobby was here. Rachel's in the back and the rest of the team, where's Bonnie and, and uh, Mary and Brittany, the team that's on the staff, uh, I am more intentional this year. I want to create space for our staff to find rest, especially before we make a big move. And so rest is the first thing that Tyler, uh, Pastor Tyler says. The second thing he says is you got to remember. And this is a quote. He says, we can't afford to rest, or we can afford to rest, because Christ empowers us to look back and remember that his work is finished. From his birth to his resurrection, let's remember the work that he did. Isn't that great? we got to remember why Jesus came and that he came and he gave his life. He said this act of remembering fuels our faith and joy in the midst of the holiday season. We need to remember. The resting leads or must lead to remembering. And then he adds a third thing. Receive. 
And he started to talk about receiving, but he didn't talk about receiving. Let me explain, or let me just read. He says, once we remember all that we have been given in the gift of God, we can then give to others with a heart that is overflowed with, thanks, uh, with thankfulness. Giving is often at the center of many churches and leaders in the holiday agendas, but one thing I've learned is that we must receive from the Lord before we give with gratitude. See how the difference is? So it's, yeah, we give, but we got to receive first. So we remember what God has done, and we receive His presence. It's beautiful. He goes on to say it's receiving from Him, receiving the abundance God has for us in Christ. Here's a fourth thing. So we not only rest, and then we remember, we receive. The fourth thing is we restore. And this is the critical piece. It says, finally, accompany God in His mission of restoration and redemption by extending those God-given gifts to others. We want to look for relationships that need to be restored, people's hearts that are away from God to be restored. He says, I want to challenge my team by giving in, uh, in a truly sacrificial way. Simply put, give in a way that hurts. It's easy to, and comfortable to give materialistic gifts to a friend, but, I, but aim to give the gift of grace to a family member that's hurt you. Or give more time or energy or, uh, to a struggling teammate. It says these difficult acts of giving are often rooted in restoration for the team, for a family member, or even yourself. And he lays these things out, and I was thinking, okay, we got rest and to remember and receive and restore. And just like a great holiday recipe, you throw things in the mix and you mix it all up. What if these were the ingredients? These were the themes that we hung on to this Christmas. See, the truth is, there's always something around Christmas that we cannot control. But we can control this. We can do this. And so my question is, what in your life can you simplify? What, where can we make that transition? Where, where the projects that maybe have been important in the past, maybe they're not so important. Maybe it's not so important that you win the contest in your neighborhood for the best lit house, right? Or maybe it is, I don't know. But whatever the expectation, make sure that it's appropriate in your situation. With the cooking, uh, I, I saw one person, they talked about the busyness, and with cooking, they said, stick to recipes that you know. Stick with basic meals, or even order your groceries online. Now, I've never done that. I think it's a good idea. Maybe I should do that for Jessica. With kids, be realistic. Be realistic, and help your kids to understand the true meaning of Jesus, or of Christmas, that it's Jesus. You know, Jesus is the reason for the season. That's more than a cliche, right? Now, there's a, a theme or a uh, philosophy that I'd like to talk about. And you've heard it probably before. It's the KISS philosophy. Keep it simple. I didn't say it. <laughs> I was going to say keep it simple, silly. Or keep it, s keep it simple, uh, what did my wife say for a service? <laughs> Sweetie. <laughs> and, uh, but you said it's stupid, right? And the truth is, we do need to keep things simple. Let's kiss our Christmas traditions. Let's keep it simple. What if we really tried to simplify? What if you did? Or what if we attempted to slow down when everything was ramping up? Or what if we said no when we were absolutely compelled to say yes? Is it possible? Absolutely it is. I want to go back to the verse in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we see this interchange. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, because you are worried and upset about many things. He's really speaking about the frenzy, the craziness. But few things are needed, or only one in reality. And Mary has chosen what is better, the presence of God. I 
thought what we could do is here in this moment to slow down just enough. And what I did is I paraphrased that verse with the context of Christmas. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you close your eyes. And just like Jesus was speaking to Martha, what I'd like you to imagine is that Jesus is speaking to you and into your situation. And I'm going to change the words just a bit, but the same idea. And this is as if Jesus were speaking directly to you. I think Jesus might say just this. He would say to you, stop rushing. Stop being busy. Stop trying to do everything for everyone and just take a minute to remember me. This season, you're gearing up to celebrate, right? Well, it's not really about presents and parties and trying to do all the holiday things you feel like you're supposed to do. It's not really about having a great time with your family, even. It's definitely not about swirling around the demands of the calendar. Stop the frenzy and make time for me. I believe Jesus, if he was here, he would say that. Stop the frenzy and make time for him. Church, with your eyes on me now, what is the most important thing this Christmas? Without a shadow of a doubt, it's the presence of God. And we can't afford to miss it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. Thank you for the encouragement. And Lord, I pray that in these next few moments, God, that you would get the glory and the honor as we commit our ways to you. And Lord, help us to find rest. Help us to remember what you've done for us. Help us to receive your presence in our life. And Lord, help us to find restorative ways to make this season really count. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. With everyone's head bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I don't know everyone here, certainly. And uh, we've got some guests and some different others that have been only for a short time. This morning, I want to offer you the free gift of salvation that comes with the Christmas story. Jesus, the Christmas story talks about Jesus coming to earth, right? But then he lived a perfect life and ended up dying on a cross, and he did it for you and for me. And what happens is he takes our sin. He, he takes the sin that we deserve to be punished for, and he took it on the cross. When he died, all the weight of the world was put on his shoulder, all the sin. Can you even imagine the weight of that? Every bad word, every mistake, every time someone stole, every time someone was murdered, every time someone backstabbed or stole, or what, what, you know, whatever the case might be. And it was all on his shoulders. And the reality of Christmas is he did it for you but we have to receive it we have to receive it just like we receive a gift and if you're ready this morning to receive the gift of salvation it's a free gift it doesn't cost anything other than your life i guess but if you're ready to receive salvation or to get your life right with the lord i'm just going to encourage you to lift your hand i want to pray for you don't go through this season yeah young man right here yep young lady over here Anyone else, just slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. That the Holy Spirit, He's working in you. He's, he's drawing you back, or maybe you've never considered about your faith. You can go ahead and put your hands down. Anyone else, just, I just, just don't want to miss anyone. We've been praying that every Sunday there'd be people that would surrender their hearts to the Lord. And we're so excited. We got two here for the sake of the two. Could I just lead you in a prayer? It's not the words of this prayer that save you. It's really believing what we're about to say and making it our own. But let's do this together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, 
please forgive me for all my sins and come into my life. I believe that you died on the cross and took my sin on your shoulders. Thank you. And now I commit my life to you. Save me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And what's awesome is we rejoice with even when the angels in heaven rejoice and we rejoice with them. And so we praise the Lord for this young man, this young lady. Praise the Lord. And we'll follow up with those here in just a moment. But church, the most important thing this season is the presence of God. And the big takeaway that I want all of us to understand is that the way we find the presence is not only just here in an atmosphere like this where the presence of God certainly is here, but you got to know that the Holy Spirit, His presence, it goes with us. And in our day-to-day adventure, whatever that looks like, we need to look to Him And he's the one that will take us when we're overwhelmed and he changes things and he helps us. He's the one that can bring a simple look to a crazy season. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like for you to just stand where you are and we're going to reprise the song, God, I Look to You. But I want you to sing it this time with a perspective of Christmas and all the things around Christmas that catch our hearts and our minds. And what I'd like you to do is to sing it with me. And, uh, uh, and then we'll be back to close the service in just a second. Amen. There's nothing more important than being in his presence. And after being in his presence, the only other thing that matters in life is our determination to reach one more. And what I'd like to do is to close the service in this attitude of in the presence, in the presence of God. And what we've done is we've created a little tool to think about the one person in our life that needs Jesus. The one person in our life that if they found Christ, their Christmas and their, their total future would be changed. The one person that if they didn't make it to heaven, it would grieve you so deeply that you would say, man, I, I, I couldn't even see myself in heaven without my mom or without my dad or without my neighbor, without my coworker. And what we, what we did first service, we're going to do again, is we're going to just take some time, each of us, to think about the one person, and we're going to come forward And there are ornaments in here. And then once we put the name of that person, and maybe it's your entire family, you can spend some time. And to do that, then we're going to take it and we're going to put it on these three trees or on these three trees over here. Not those two trees. (laughs) But we're doing this. Listen, to be in the presence of God, there's nothing more important. And then after that, what do we do? The most important thing you would ever do would be to reach one more. So we want to activate you this season. And so without further ado, let's head back into the song. I'm going to fill one out, and I want you to join me. There are pens here, and it'll take a little bit of time. Don't worry, just make your way, and that'll be great. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. The names that have been added to these trees are names that God has, has been, that Jesus has been interceding at the right hand of the Father ever since he went back to heaven. And these names absolutely matter. And I believe that as you take the presence of God with you this season, and you invite one of these names to a service, or even better than that, you share your faith in in a moment of boldness around the Christmas season, These lives will be changed forever. How many believe that with me? Let it be, God. The most important thing after being in the presence of God is to lift up our voice and to reach one more.
And we want to provide opportunity for that this season. Uh, the, this Christmas series, there's four parts. And, if, and all four of these weeks would have been good to be here. But you say, is there one in particular? On the 16th, the family service, the day that we're talking about family, the, the topic that day is forgiveness. And I promise you, I've, I've, I've preached a few s- series over the years on forgiveness, and they are always, always, always a highlight. People wanting to listen, going back. And, uh, and so get your families here because we want to see God do miracles. And it's going to be a, day, a family day. The kids will be a part of the service singing. It's going to be really special. But listen, these names are why we exist. These names are why we're building a new facility to house more people. These names are all that matter. And we will pray, and we are going to pray, and we want you to be praying that we are activated, all of us, to reach one more. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we'll be activated in Jesus' name. And Lord, that you'd go before us, behind us, and all around us. As we leave this room, we are entering the mission field. And Lord, use us in that way. We pray it all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. We love you. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegatewaygh.com.